voy a hablar un poco en español y después en español. Muchísimas gracias para Antonio, para su conferencia, está muy interesante. Seguro vamos a discutir cosas después. Y otra vez, muchísimas gracias para Emma y para Julio Luis, que está aquí, y a los otros miembros del grupo para, mí, para invitarme. Cuando estaba aquí hace dos años presentando mi, mi segundo libro de ontología en Heidegger y Toulouse, promete que la próxima vez voy a hablar en español. Entonces, me, me disculpen, pero eh, cuando lo practicamos era un desastre totalmente. Eh, después de esas siete líneas, Emma me dijo, simplemente mi acento era de Giri, es demasiado fuerte para este. Eh, cambiamos los conceptos, especialmente eh, por, por el fin de la conferencia, está un poco técnico y yo no puedo cambiar mi acento demasiado rápido. Entonces, eh, en el espíritu de Levinas voy a, voy a hablar a través de eh, la traducción, traducción, traducción eh, español, que Emma lo preparó, y eh, muchas gracias para eso. Y entonces voy a, hablar, voy a cambiar para, para inglés. ¿no? Eh, Uh, Heidegger's attempt to re-raise re the question of the meaning of being was obviously highly original and influential. While Heidegger's thinking underwent a number of significant conceptual changes, including an all-important Kire, subsequent thinkers, especially within France, tended to continue to privilege the fundamental insights of being and time. Two moments were taken to stand out. First, Heidegger's affirmation of the fundamental importance of ontology and second, the claim, integral to the ontological difference, that prior to any reflective comprehension of an entity lies a pre-comprehendable, non-objective awareness of the being of the entity. With this, Heidegger was understood to have moved the terms of the debate from a questioning of that which presents itself to the question of the manner in which an entity is presented, and indeed to a questioning of the horizon from where entities appear. These themes were conceptually important in themselves, but they were also crucial to the development of Husserlian-inspired phenomenology, and so it is no surprise to find that Emmanuel Levinas, the author of one of the first books in French on Husserl's philosophy, should take an avid interest in Heidegger's philosophy. Levinas, however, has an ambiguous relationship to Heidegger. Initially, he is highly critical of Heidegger's affirmation of ontology, mainly because Levinas sees in it the continuation of a Christian-inspired af affirmation of abstract identity. In the 1934 essay, Reflections on the Philosophy of Hitlerism, Levinas accounts for the rise of Nazism by, by charting a history of Western thought from its Christian origins. Heideggerian ontology is placed at the last stage in the process through which Nazism develops. For Levinas, then, it was no surprise that Heidegger became a Nazi. It is inherent to his philosophy. After the Second World War, however, Levinas' position towards Heidegger becomes more nuanced. In the 1951 essay, Is Ontology Fundamental? Levinas talks of, quote, the dignity of contemporary ontological research, and that the work of Heidegger remains striking in that it pays radical attention to the urgent preoccupations of the moment the abstract question of the meaning of being, qua being, and the question of the present spontaneously reunite." In 1951, as in 1934, there is something in Heidegger's thinking that accords with the philosophical, um, sorry, there is something that accords with the historical moment, the difference being that it now accords with the philosophical as opposed to the political moment. Indeed, Levinas continued to affirm the philosophical importance of Heidegger's being in time, going so far as to say in a 1981 interview with Philippe Nemo that, quote, it is one of the finest books in the history of philosophy. I say this after years of reflection. The reason being that Levinas understands Heidegger to affirm two important methodological innovations that Levinas will continue to insist on. First, Levinas sees in Heidegger a thinker committed to combating pure intellectualism <coughs> with concrete analyses of concrete experiences. And second, Levinas holds that there is, in Heidegger's thinking, an apparent, at least in being in time, preoccupation with questions of individual comportment. That is, a questioning of individual behaviours, actions, and ways of being that the intellectualization inherent to previous thought had not permitted. It would appear from this that while Levinas of 1934 sees Heidegger's affirmation of, of ontology as leading to the political horrors of Nazism, with the consequence one would think 
that Heidegger's affirmation of ontology would forever be tarnished, the Levinas of 1951 not only seems to distinguish the philosophical and political implications of Heidegger's affirmation of ontology, but actually comes to affirm the philosophical importance of it. This does not, however, entail a wholesale affirmation of Heidegger's thinking. Rather, as Levinas's attitude towards Heidegger becomes subtler, so too does his critique of the with the consequence that as he comes to accept aspects of Heidegger's thinking, he simultaneously develops a line of critique based on the premise that meaning is socially constructed from concrete human relations, with the consequence that he comes to reject Heidegger's claim that ontology is foundational. For Levinas, the question of the meaning of being emanates from social relation, and as such, is grounded in ethics. By criticising the very foundations of Heidegger's affirmation of the primary importance of ontology, Levinas's affirmation of ethics not only undermines the validity of Heidegger's philosophy, but also aims to undermine their political implications, as he, Levinas, sees them, by showing that a politics based in and from the ethical relation and aiming at universal justice, what Levinas elsewhere calls prophetic politics, is the logical outcome of actual concrete human existence. However, while Levinas's critique is an innovative one, one, there are problems with it, specifically relating to his reading of Heidegger and his relationship to ontology. Nonetheless, engaging in it will start to show how Husserlian-inspired phenomenology moved from epistemological ontological concerns to ethical political ones, while in so doing also bringing to the fore the relationship between philosophy and politics, ontology and ethics, and the question of how to understand the human. Levinas first discusses Heidegger, or rather, the approach Heidegger takes, in the early and often ignored 1934 essay, Reflections on the Philosophy of Hitlerism, the purpose of which is to explain how Europe, with its long, rationalist, humanist tradition, could give rise to the death camps of the Holocaust, or at least the rise of Hitlerism. For Levinas, the Holocaust death camps were not simply an anomaly of Western reason, but somewhat controversially, are the most explicit manifestation of the way of thinking that has dominated the West since its roots in ancient Greece. To support his conclusion, Levinas charts a sweeping history that sees the logic of its Christian foundations being manifested throughout subsequent Western thought, first with liberalism and subsequently with the rise of ontology. For Levinas, the chief principle that defines Western civilization is the notion of freedom, defined in terms of, quote, man being absolutely free in his relations with the world and the possibilities that solicit action from him, end quote. With this, the individual is divorced from history, with this allowing him to freely, freely decide his relations with the world. The fundamental historical moment where this took place was not with Judaism and the ancient Greeks, both of which Levinas claims had a profound understanding of history and its relationship to the present, but with Christianity and in particular its rupture of the soul from the body. The introduction of the Christian division between an essential and corporal soul and physical body led to various consequences, so Levinas thinks. First, to a privileging of ontology, insofar as it perpetuates the idea that to understand the truth of something, it is necessary to understand the being of each entity rather than the way it comports itself towards the other. This is obviously the beginning of Levinas' ongoing critique of Heidegger's privileging of the question of the meaning to be. Second, this ontological understanding is based on the notion of a fixed essence, which thinks of entities in terms of pure presence, and can th cannot think of anything beyond or other than this essence. This is problematic for Levinas because it means that everything can be enclosed within a totality, a notion he associates with homogeneity, and the annihilation of alterity. Third, the focus on a fixed defining essence is based on a primordial understanding that it is possible to determine, once and for all, the truth of that particular entity. Fourth, the focus on a fixed essence leads to a separation of a fixed essence from its outer, inessential appearance. By associating the essential element with the non-physical world, the Christian soul-body division sanctions and even encourages the notion that the truth of the world is based on something other than the physical world. There is, in other words, a flight from the concrete to the abstract. And fifth, the combination of these leads to an inability to think the other. The relationship between egoism and ontology brings Levinas to claim that the violence committed against others in the name of ontology's conceptual reduction of the other to the same is mirrored by and indeed supported by egoism. Understanding that the individual is an egoistic monad can quite easily lead to the conclusion that it must be safeguarded by annihilating the other, or at least degrading it to a secondary phenomenon or object. 
The problem with this for Levinas is that by being, quote, treated exclusively as an object, man is also mistreated and misconstrued, end quote. It is at this moment that violence arises, or rather one form of violence. While Levinas recognises the common understanding of physical violence, entailing one object annihilating another or imposing itself physically onto another, he rejects the, redu the reduction of violence to the sense. There is another sense of violence, called here ontological violence, which occurs when the other is conceptually reduced to the status of the same. Rather than be valued or respected on its terms in its alterity, the other is judged by universal standards, thought from the same principle as others, and or conceptually reduced to the same designation as others. The other is not, in other words, respected in its alterity. Physical violence is derived from this conceptual ontological violence. Putting the two forms together, we find Levinas concluding that violence entails the conceptual reduction of the other's alterity to the same principles, which can lead to the more ominous physical annihilation of the other. Focusing ontology leads to a search for a fixed essential truth that is abstract and so divorced from the concrete world, which by holding that the truth of each entity is realised through this same essence, leads to the conclusion that the particular uniqueness of each entity need not be recognised. Each particular entity must be reduced to the same abstract essence, whereby the other is swallowed by the same, reduced to the same, or thought from the same. This is important because it leads to the notion that the other's alterity is unessential and can be swept away to preserve the sanctity of the essential same, an attitude that Levinas diagnoses as lying at the foundation of Nazism. Reducing the other to the same means that the, other, the alterity of the other is extinguished. This is not based on a decision, but is contained within the logic of an ontological understanding that focuses on the truth and which sees the answer to reside in a fixed, universal, abstract essence. By claiming that Heidegger's affirmation of ontology lies at the penultimate stage of the logical and historical development of Nazism, Levinas implicates it and indeed makes him responsible for the political horrors of Nazism. It presumably was the most surprise to him that Heidegger joined the Nazi party. Levinas's early critique of Heidegger is then absolute. Not only does he fail to find anything positive to say about Heidegger's thinking, but by linking it to the historical process that leads to Nazism, Levinas charges Heidegger with philosophical and political complicity in the Holocaust. However, perhaps not surprisingly for someone who warns of the danger of totalization, Levinas himself came to realize that his early critique of Heidegger was too one-dimensional, too total. This led to a rather dramatic alteration in Levinas's thinking, to the extent that in 1947, existence existence, he explains that if at the beginning of our reflections are in large measure inspired by the philosophy of Martin Heidegger, where we find the concept of ontology and of the relationship which man sustains with being, they are also governed by a profound need to leave the climate of that philosophy, and by the conviction that we cannot leave it for, for a philosophy that will be pre heideggerian Not only does Levinas explicitly place his thinking in the shadows of Heidegger's, but Heidegger now appears not as the end point of a particular logic that leads to political horrors, but as a break with past thinking that opens up new philosophical avenues. Levinas now sees that there is something revolutionary about Heidegger's thinking. Nevertheless, he also warns that there is something not entirely satisfactory with it. As such, while Heidegger leaves behind the tradition to open new pathways, Levinas proclaims the need to depart further from those pathways and from Heidegger. The reasons for this are spelled out four years later in the important essay, Is Ontology Fundamental? Levinas starts by praising Heidegger's ontological analysis for two reasons. First, Heidegger is understood to have realised that the presentation of entities needs to be explained. It cannot simply be taken for granted and subsequently studied. Rather, the way in which entities present themselves, not simply the fact that they are presented, is key to understanding them. There is then the need to focus on what Levinas calls the here below, meaning both a focusing on this world in contradistinction to a focusing on a transcendent world, to explain this one, and a focusing on the pre-ontic processes that bring forth entities as they present themselves. Second, Levinas claims that Heidegger's focus on the significance of human beings' pre-comprehension of being, where human cognition has a pre-ontic understanding of being, quote, constitutes the great novelty of contemporary ontology, quote, because it means that prior to any act of signifying intention, there is another realm, one not constituted by distinctive objective ontic acts, but a flowing experience that is more fundamental to comprehension. 
As a consequence, Heidegger's ontology points to the need for a thorough study of how the human being in its concrete existence moves, acts, and is. Or, as Levinas puts it, quote, the comprehension of being does not presuppose a merely theoretical attitude, but the whole of human comportment. The whole human being is ontology. Well, it seems to be based on a fundamental under sorry, misunderstanding of Heidegger's ontological difference, specifically Heidegger's insistence, uh, one that becomes greater after the Kieran, that the study of human Dasein is to illuminate being and not just human Dasein. For Levinas, Heidegger's ontological analysis is important because it calls us to focus with the new figure and intent on the concrete living embodied actions and being of human beings. In other words, the revelation of being reveals the nature of human being. It does so not by imposing an intellectual understanding onto human being, but by letting human being reveal itself through its existent uh, being or act. Importantly, Levinas points out that human being always exists and acts in relation to others. Sorry, other entities. There is no pure realm where human being exists. Its actions are always caught in unintended relations, and through its actions affect disturbances in those relations. As Levinas explains, the comedy of human life begins with the simplest of our movements, each of which carries with it an inevitable awkwardness. In putting out my hand to approach a chair, I have creased the sleeve of my jacket. In, uh, I've, in, uh, in scratching the floor, I have dropped the ash from my cigarette. In doing that which I wanted to do, I have done so many things I did not want. The act has not been pure, for I have left some traces. In wiping out these traces, I have left others. Human being exists within a network of relations, each of which is imperceptibly tied to others. This is not the notion that the ego is the focal point from which everything emanates from and returns to, but a notion of metaphysics based on entwinement and relations wherein each action disturbs rather than controls or creates the relations that define the horizon through and from which it exists. This background horizon cannot be comprehended, but nevertheless is concrete and very real. Therefore, while Levinas agrees with Heidegger that there is a preconceptual horizon supporting the actions and being of human beings, they differ in terms of what this entails. As is well known, in Being in Time, Heidegger initially affirms the study of human Dasein to reveal the non-anthropocentric horizon supporting human Dasein, i.e. being. Levinas, however, holds that Heidegger's focus on the question of the meaning of being not only falls into abstraction, what for example is being, but affirms a unitary horizon that reduces difference to unity, or in Levinas's words, alterity to the same. As such, Levinas focuses on the preconceptual horizon to better understand the concrete living embodiment of human Dasein. For Levinas, this horizon is found within the human being, given that he understands human being to be relational, and so from the other. In contrast, Levinas understands Heidegger to insist that being forms a horizon from which human being stands. From a Levinasian perspective, therefore, properly understanding human being requires an analysis of the preconceptual social relations that constitute human being, not, as he understands Heidegger to insist on, an analysis of the pre-human horizon from where human being stands from. In Totality and Infinity, Levinas will, of course, locate the preconceptuality of social relations in the immediate experience of the other's face. For Heidegger, however, this simply reaffirms the anthropocentrism of humanist metaphysics, and in so doing, affirms the tradition that has forgotten or ignored the question of being. For this reason, Simon Critchley explains that, quote, from a Heideggerian perspective, one might object that Levinas simply returns to a classical metaphysics of beingness. That is, a determination of being in terms of beings, and a humanistic privilege of one particular entity, the human being. While well, Critchley finds such a reading appealing to a certain extent, he holds that there is more going on in Levinas' thinking than Levinas developing his position from a misreading of Heidegger's. Critchley finds in Levinas' use of language an attempt to displace the language of metaphysics by taking over and subtly changing the meaning of words such as ethics, subjectivity, and metaphysics. Levinas' thinking is not simply based on a reversal of a misinterpretation of Heidegger's ontological difference, but consciously employs the language of metaphysics to point beyond the closure inherent to traditional metaphysics. To this, I would like to add that Levinas' thinking is far more aware of Heidegger's of the apparatic impl implications of trying to think beyond entities. 
Whereas Heidegger recognises the difficulty thinking has in thinking being and ends up calling for a complete transformation in thinking, a new language, a new relationship to technology, there is still a sense in which his prognosis is premised on the idea that if this can occur, the truth of being can be comprehended. Even if Levinas's reading of Heidegger's ontological difference is flawed, and Alex Thomas's description of it as, quote, a brutal reading, end quote, seems appropriate, Levin, yes, sorry, Heidegger's continuing emphasis on the necessity of revealing, of revealing the truth of being allows Levinas to charge that Heidegger continues to privilege epistemic totality rather than ethical infinity. For Levinas, no matter how hard we try, we cannot comprehend existence, what Heidegger calls being, because existence exceeds comprehension. There will always be a aporias to our understanding, not because of a failure to understand correctly, but because the nature of existence is such that it exceeds comprehension. Heidegger and Levinas agree, therefore, that the Western tradition has been focused on presence and closure. They disagree on what this entails. In Heidegger's case, he claims that it is because the tradition has ignored or forgotten the question of the meaning of being, and in so doing has forgotten or ignored the openness associated with this question. For Levinas, it is because the Western tradition has forgotten the notion of alterity, and so has reduced entities to a single point, single principle, or singular truth. Even though Heidegger insists that being entails openness and so cannot be reduced to a unity point or fixed presence, Levinas responds that simply by virtue of always returning a study of entities to the question of being, Heidegger is responsible for reducing the absolute alterity that exists between entities to the same question. For all his conceptual innovation, therefore, Levinas sees in Heidegger a continuation of the Western tradition's reduction of alterity to the same. Having outlined his fundamental critique of Heidegger, Levinas spends the rest of his ontology fundamental tracing the bare outlines of his alternative, an alternative that on the one hand accepts Heidegger's insistence on the fundamental importance of pre-comprehension of human existence, but on the other hand rejects Heidegger's insistence that a, human, that a study of human being is a precursor <coughs> to the study of being. Rather, first, the study of human being must be orientated from, to, and around human being in and through its concrete actions. Second, this study must recognise that human existence is structured from a pre-comprehensive experience. And third, so as to overcome the tradition's privileging of sameness, each human being, including each relationship, must be thought from absolute alterity. Concrete human being, pre-comprehensive experience and alterity form the coordinates from which Levinas will focus his study of the being of human being, to use Heidegger's language. To achieve this, Levinas looks not to abstract thought to comprehend existence, but to concrete experience to identify an experience that points beyond being. This has drastic implications for the conclusion here. As Adrian Peppersack explains, well, whereas Heidegger's search is dominated by the quest of being itself, Levinas points to another beyond, the other who faces me, awakens me to a dimension beyond the universe of beings and their being. In speaking to somebody, I transcend the realm of being by accepting my being meant to be there for the other. <laughs> Levinas draws out the conclusions of this assertion, namely that if humans first exist, exist in the impersonal there is of being, where they experience others who are subsequently attributed with meaning, the social rela the relation exists prior to the determinations of human existence. Meaning, in other words, is a secondary order phenomenon that results from a prior order of social interaction. The source of meaning is therefore found in and through the focal point of this social interaction, with the consequence that, quote, even the philosophy that questions the meaning of being does so on the basis of the encounter with the other. The primordial encounter with the other cannot be language or concepts because these are based in meaning and hence a form of understanding which is grounded in a particular understanding of being. For Levinas, the primordial encounter is found in the non-thematizable, non-conceptual experience of the face-to-face -face relation. As such, Heidegger's privileging ontology as first philosophy is actually based on a prior moment, the social relation that gives meaning to the question, what is the meaning of being? Even as Heidegger denies it, his ontological quest is premised on the sociality inherent to the ethical relation. For this reason, Levinas concludes the quote, to be or not to be is probably not the question, I 
I have not sought to, nor have I been able to, fully outline how Levinas's critique of Heidegger allows him to develop an original account of ethics and notion of selfhood based from the other. But I hope to have shown that Levinas's critique of Heidegger is one of the most original and intimate available. There are, however, problems with it. By way of conclusion, I will simply point to two. First, as I have noted throughout, not only does Levinas's evaluation of Heidegger change, but there is a sense in which it is based on a fundamental misunderstanding of Heidegger's position, especially the notion of the ontological difference. For Levinas, Heidegger's ontological difference does not actually entail a difference conditioned by openness, but entails the reduction of each entity to a, pr a prior pre-comprehensive entity called being. Of course, the key facet of Heidegger's ontological difference is the notion that being is manifested in and expressed differently in and through each entity, and so cannot itself be thought of as an entity. Levinas seems then to depend on a highly questionable conception of the ontological difference to develop its affirmation of the ethical relation. Indeed, on a different reading of Heidegger, one that sees the ontological difference as insisting on the difference between being and entities, and that each entity is conditioned by a different sense of being, the concrete alterity that Levinas points to seems to be prefigured in Heidegger's thinking. The difference, of course, would still be that Heidegger wants to go beyond human being to a prior moment called being, Whereas Levinas wants to insist that the beyond that Heidegger looks for outside of human being is in reality found within human being. This is a subtle difference, but it is a key one, for it means that whereas Heidegger's thinking explicitly aims to leave the sphere of human being to focus on the non-anthropological horizon from which human being emanates from and is conditioned by, Levinas explicitly aims to remain within the sphere of human being. The second question that Levinas' questionable analysis of Heidegger's uh, ontological difference throws up is the troubling status of ontology, or the question of being, within Levinas' thinking. For example, whereas his critique of Heidegger would seem to downplay the notion of ontology, we find that throughout his writings, Levinas continues to depend upon a particular conception of human being, and by extension, understanding of what it is to be human. For example, in the early reflections on the philosophy of Hitlerism, a simple reversal takes place where egoism is rejected and an, and an embedded, embodied understanding of the ego affirmed. Rather than be, being divorced from its social world, Levinas claims that we must recognise the quote, the situation to which he was bound was not added to him but formed the very foundation of his being. End quote. It is through the body that the self community and interacts with its situation, with the consequence that Levinas wants to offer a, quote, new conception of man, wherein the body is not something eternally foreign, end quote, but forms the focal point from where analyses must start. This alters somewhat in totality and infinity, where Levinas starts from the ego, but undermines this egoistic standpoint by undertaking a phenomenological analysis that shows that significance emanates from the experience of the other through the face-to-face -face relation. His critique of egoism is radicalised in Otherwise Than Being, where he develops the notion of substitution to argue that the ego does not exist and subsequently experience the other, but in its being is an effect of the other. Levinas' description of the ethical relation always then implicitly depends on ontology, with this dependency becoming increasingly ex explicit until we find him explaining in the 1986 interview with Richard Kearney that, quote, we can never completely escape from the language of ontology and politics, end quote. There's a growing awareness on Levinas's part that the attempt to overcome ontology can never be total. This does not mean that, sim that Levinas simply returns to privilege ontology, but there is greater appreciation that his earlier call to overcome ontology by simply replacing it with ethics was too naive. With this, Levinas moves from thinking of transformation in terms of rupture to recognising that it must be based on transition. For this reason, while his early thought emphasises that a privileging of the ethical relation entails a rupture from past thought, his later thinking comes to recognise that the ethical requires the totality of ontology to order and organise the responses demanded by the ethical relation. Overcoming ontology does not entail a leap beyond ontology, nor can it simply be reversed. Ontology has to be continually contended with. While he initially criticises the privileging of, of totality by showing its dependence on infinity, Levinas recognises that totality, or what he calls politics, and infinity, what he calls ethics, are both necessary for political justice to prevail. Despite his critique of Heideggerian ontology, therefore, Levinas does rely on a form of ontology, one that is contextual, historical, relational, and non-essentialist. 
But ontology is not primarily for Levinas because his ontology is premised on a more fundamental question regarding the relationship between I and world that gives rise to the questioning of and signification inherent to Heidegger's ontological analysis. What exactly ontology entails and how it fits together with ethics in Levinas's thinking is, however, never explicitly resolved. These questions are the first that his critique of Heidegger leads us to, although it is, important, it is also important to note that his critique of Heidegger specifically and his wider thought generally feed into and offer crucial contributions to subsequent post-structuralist, deconstructuralist, post-humanist and contemporary political theological debates that question the need for and possibility of a differential ontology, the sources of signification, the nature of transformation and the human's role in these. It is for these reasons that despite his problems, Levinas's critique of Heidegger is not only important for any understanding of his own project, but also for any attempt to understand the trajectory of Husserlian-inspired phenomenology, including its relationship to the other movements mentioned above.